Grace be unto you and peace from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text before us this morning for our consideration for Matthew's Gospel, the 19th chapter, begins with the 16th verse. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, the account we have before us as our text this morning is of a young man who comes to Jesus with a heartfelt question. In Mark's gospel and in Luke's gospel, which also record this, we are told that when he came to Jesus, he knelt before him. We're also told that he was a rich young ruler, so he probably had some high position in the church. And he came with all the respect and seemingly had modesty to come before his Lord and ask a question that had been bothering him. What one thing is left for me to do that I might have eternal life? It's always very difficult for us as Christians to point out that someone's not going to go to heaven if they don't believe in Jesus. It is so much easier to preach the gospel and to say, believe in Jesus Christ, look to him, look to the cross, confess your sin, believe that Jesus died and you'll have eternal life. It's difficult for us to say to that person that just really doesn't care about religion, doesn't really care about going to church, thinks it's a bunch of hypocrites there, but yet they are such wonderful people, such wonderful neighbors. As a matter of fact, I would trust them more than some people that go to church. It's difficult at times for us to just appreciate the fact if you are a good person or if you are a bad person or if you are anywhere in between, everyone needs Jesus. And so perhaps it's good to have an account or a, a text like this to remind us that even those who may attend worship faithfully may pride themselves in having a wonderful prayer life, may give generously to the cause of the church and Christian missions, may do so many things that are upright and noble, but yet still are lacking that one thing that is needed, and that is dependence upon Jesus Christ for their salvation. Who was this young man who came to Jesus? We're not told a great deal about him, but we can tell a lot about him by his actions. He was respectful. He did not come with a haughty attitude, although one would say it appears that way after he answered some of Jesus' questions. I no doubt he was respected by many and thought of as being just a, a very wonderful person. But yet, as we will come to find out, there was something very drastically mis missing. Early in my ministry here, there was a couple that attended church. Well, I should say there was a wife who attended church regularly. Regularly. Her husband, not so much. He was not a member of the church. He never wished to become a member of the church. But he loved to get me out of the golf course with him, and he was calling me all the time. Preacher, can you go golf with me today? I thought, I've got other things I've got to be doing. And one day he said, um, does your church need any tables or any chairs or anything like that? And that was back in the time when we needed some tables and some chairs and such. And he says, there's a business going out of town, or out of, there's, a, there's a business here in town that's going out of business. And they are selling a lot of different things. But we can go there before they sell. And so he we went there, and it was very obviously he knew this business was very obvious. They were joking around. And he says, Preacher, look around. You know, what do you need? What does the church need? 
need some of those tables, some of those tables. And the guy says, there's more in the back and, and so on. And we went and looked and I said, uh, well, certainly those tables. As a matter of fact, the ones that the youngest class in, in Sunday school are using right now, are, those are the ones that came from that. Anyway, when we picked out a few things that we needed there, and not to be greedy or anything, but um, some folding tables and some chairs. And so the man said, um, the owner said, well, that's, that's about $75. And this individual says to him, it's for the church. <laughs> give them to them. And they're going, I just can't give it to them. And they're going back and forth, and eventually, they were given to us. <laughs> His wife was always so concerned. She said, Pastor, I know that if he dies, that the church won't bury him. This is not a matter of whether the church buries him or not. It's a matter of what's in his heart. You know, we could have a service that would be very meaningless for you if he did not have that in his heart, that he believed that Jesus was a savior from sin. There's a happy ending to this because when the person contracted cancer, we had said, well, it's time to get very serious about this. Um, do you believe that you are a sinner and that Jesus died for your sins? And he said, I think I believe that. I think I have believed that all along, he said. It's just that I didn't really act upon it. And he, his family, lived up in Milwaukee, and he moved up to Milwaukee with his wife, and he became a member of the church, received communion from the pastor there, and shortly thereafter, he passed away from the cancer. A good person. He did a lot. He would do anything for the church, but be a member here. And I would often tell him about that. You know, why don't you come some Sunday? And um, he would make excuses and just said, no, nah, it's not for me, and, and so on. And so he didn't pressure it or pursue it any further. Yeah. You all know people who you say are good people. And you know in your heart that they don't believe in Jesus and that they aren't worshiping regularly, and it breaks your heart. And so we just keep on praying for them, preaching out the gospel, because there's a really absolute fact. We either believe in Jesus and are saved, or we do not believe in Jesus and we are lost eternally. And that puts a lot of seriousness in our mission and in our effort and our outreach to people. Because we know that in many instances the time is short. And we pray that the Lord would somehow open their hearts and make room in their hearts for the message of the gospel and of the cross. This young ruler came to Jesus because he thought he was all right. But you notice even that, even those who think that they are all right in their life and that God is not angry with them because they don't carry on like other people do, even they have struggles in their life when it comes to matters of faith. And this person who came to Jesus had that nagging question, there must be something else that I am not doing that is going to secure for me eternal life. I just have to ask Jesus. And he comes with all respect and all modesty, and he says, dear, 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 dear master, dear teacher, what is that one thing? All along thinking that I've done all these things, I have acted this way in my life, and so there must be some certain thing that will give me peace of conscience that I can do, that will make it all better. And it'll make it right with God. And so he asked the question. It was a good question. It was a right question. And he went to the right person to ask this question. And so Jesus outlines the second table of the law. About loving your neighbor and, and this type of thing. And then notice what he says. All these I have done. All these I have done. It becomes very common for people to take certain commandments and say, I have never killed anyone. I'm not all that bad. And I have never taken a nickel from anyone. I have not, I've never stole anything from anyone. And I love my wife or my husband, and I've never entertained any thoughts of anything else but our marriage. And we look at those and we come to the point, then what yet, what, what must I do yet, Lord? 
You see what was missing here the whole time, that was the Lord's going to point out to him. Every single day he was breaking the first commandment. Because there was something in his life that was more of a God to him than the true God. And when Jesus pointed that out, go and sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. That was a bridge too far. That, that was just something, no, I, I can't do that. And although he didn't say it in those words, we're told that he went away sad. What was sad was that was the one who was standing right before him was his savior from sin. And he could not acknowledge that. And he could not recognize that. It is so similar to so much of what is going on today. I just can't give up that to do this. I just can't give up my weekends to go and worship. I can't give up time to do that. And you fill in the blanks. People are doing that all the time. But I read my Bible, I say my prayers, I confess my sin, I do this and I do that. But we oftentimes put aside the first and foremost of all the commands and we'll focus on things that we think we're doing all right. Never realizing that hatred is, is the equal in the eyes of God is murder. Never understanding that having covetous thoughts or greedy thoughts or miserly thoughts is just the same as stealing. Never giving that a thought. And this was brought out to this young man's attention. And it hit home. He walked away sad because he couldn't do it. He loved his things more than he loved God. And it gives us all an opportunity to search our hearts and souls. But what about us? Am I being blind to the realization that I too am loving things more than my, my, my Lord and my Savior? I'm not sure who it was. I read a, a commentator on this passage about go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And the commentator said, what if this person would have done exactly that? What if he would have come to the Lord and said, here is my, the entirety of my earthly possessions. The commentator said the Lord would have probably said, thank you, and give them all back to him. What, about six years ago, five years ago, this congregation put out a box on the back table entitled Ukraine, or Offerings for Ukraine, I'm not sure what the wording is on there. And you have generously given of yourself to putting some offerings in there. When seminary students come and fill in for me when I'm gone somewhere, you generously give to that individual. When organizations from the Senate do a presentation here, you generously give to those. Those are all over and above the budget. Yet I've not seen the budget not met in all the years that I've been here. Perhaps maybe after the first couple of years that I was here. But it's always been there. It's been more than enough. We've had a surplus every single year. And our budget each year, we look at that and we say, oh, we're setting a pretty cool bed, a budget there. You know, it's, it's pretty high. You know, last year's offerings were this, and we're a few thousand dollars more than that for this year. And now we're doing all these things for all these other things and all these other special offerings that we have. And every single year, the budget is met. You can't outgive the Lord. And sometimes when we give of ourselves in special ways, the Lord has a way of, of bringing that back into our lives in other ways. Just a couple months ago, I stood before you and I said I was very concerned because the Sid you know, was in an awkward position that they did not have $50,000 to give to Ukraine. I made a special plea to you. It's humbling. Thousand dollars here, three thousand there. A couple weeks ago, or a month ago, seven thousand from another. Not all from the congregation here, but just from other places coming in. 
when we think that we just can't park or we look at our, 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 our lives and say, well, I have to have that much. I, I cannot retire on less than that because what will happen if I do? And, and we become fearful. And we're thinking as though those are the things that are going to preserve my life or make my life good or whatever. We don't realize that the Lord has a way of replacing that in ways that we'd never understand before it actually happened. Or, or trusting in Him. The Lord does not stand before you and in a similar way say, I want you today to go home and liquidate your, your property and possession and then turn all that money in. He stands before you and asks you where your heart is. Where does your heart find pleasure? Does it find pleasure in the things that you can do of, of, of what your income can provide for you and offer to you? Or does it find pleasure in serving the Lord and looking for opportunities that in special ways I can serve the Lord? And this was brought home to this individual and, and he just could not do it. He walked away sad. That's sad. And a lot of people do. I hear it way too often for other congregations, relatives and such like that. Oh, they used to come to church all the time. They attended Sunday school and that, and all of a sudden, they, after confirmation, then they became, you know, there was less and less we saw them. Eventually, we haven't seen them in church in years. It's sad. Has the Lord changed? Has the Lord become boring? Has the Lord become something that's really not important in our lives anymore? Obviously so. Well, then what replaced it? What took that out of your life and put this into your life? That was what the Lord was pointing out to this young man. I could tell, speaking for the Lord here almost, I, I could tell what, what, what's in your heart. I could tell your intentions. But you're missing. You're missing the whole point. And that is salvation is found in the Lord. These things that we have are fleeting. There is nothing permanent to them. The things that are laid up, the treasures that are laid up for us in heaven are eternal. And so the question was right. What do I have to do to have eternal life? Knowing that there is an eternity yet beyond this life. Knowing that there is something beyond. What's sad is that he didn't listen to what the Lord said. He had his own view, his own opinion, his own way that he wished to live his life. And it wasn't what the Lord had said. By God's grace, may he fill our hearts with that love and that desire to, to want to serve him. Not because it is the one thing needful for my salvation. That has already been taken care of. Your salvation is already secure. Jesus has died for your sin. Your sins have been forgiven. Now live as forgiven children of God. Live as his children and let the love of Christ dwell in you richly as you encourage one another, as you spur one another on. The love of Christ that fills our heart. It fills us with an inexpressible joy of knowing all that he has done for me and for my salvation. May God continue to fill our hearts with that inexpressible joy. Amen.